Rosalind Velasquez was born on March 31st, 2005. Her father sadly died when Rosalind was only five years old and her mother raised her and her brother Leandro on her own. At the age of 15, Rosalind lived in an apartment in the Azalea Park area near her school in Radcliffe, Kentucky. She attended North Harden High School, but in August 2020, she was scheduled to start taking classes at home due to the COVID pandemic. Her mother said her daughter is a good girl who is very intelligent, respectful, had a great laugh, and said they were very close to one another. Rosalind took medicine for social anxiety and depression and had also developed a phobia of other people after being heavily bullied in the seventh grade. Her anxiety was so bad at times that she often hid in a walk-in closet in her apartment to cope. On August 23, 2020, Rosalind was hanging out with her cousins after a day of playing on a hoverboard with a family friend. Rosalind was known for going on late night walks, but always let her mother know where she was, but August 24, 2020 was different. Rosalind's mother saw her around 2.30 a.m. in the kitchen filling up her water bottle. After that, Rosalind left for a walk in the early morning hours, but never told her family. After leaving home that night, she was never seen again. While out walking, she was on Instagram Live with a friend. She told her friend that she had taken some pills and was outside walking in the woods. She took her medication with her, but left her favorite belongings behind, which she never went anywhere without. Her iPhone pinged in several different locations in the general area where the apartment was located, which was densely wooded. The last couple of pings were far enough apart to cause investigators to believe that she was likely traveling in a vehicle. Otherwise, she would have been running or walking very fast to cause those phone pings in those spots. Although Rosalind walked away from home in a possible suicidal state of mind and heavily medicated, there is also a question of her possibly being trafficked. Following her disappearance, her mother found a long letter in Rosalind's memory box that she had written to God two years earlier. She spoke of her appreciation to God, asked for protection and guidance, and prayed for her family, especially her mama. Unfortunately, there are very few other details available, and as of November of 2022, Rosalind remains missing, and this case remains unsolved. Have you ever been a victim of credit card fraud or identity theft? I once found out I was a victim of credit card fraud while making a small purchase at a drugstore. Earlier this year, I knew something was wrong when I was at the drugstore with my son and was told my card was declined for a $13 purchase. If I had Aura, I would have known much sooner as soon as someone else accessed my funds. So I'm excited to partner with today's sponsor, Aura. Aura's easy-to-use app includes everything you need to stay safe online. Aura protects you from scammers and hackers by scanning the so-called dark web, where criminals sell stolen information looking for your emails, passwords, and social security numbers. It alerts you fast if it finds anything. If only I had Aura sooner, it would have saved me a major headache when my credit card information was compromised, leaving me standing at the pharmacy in need of medicine, but instead forcing me to wait until the next day when I could go to the bank and get it cleared up. Aura helps you fight against annoying websites that make your personal information public by automatically requesting the removal of your info. This also supports reducing robocalls. In addition, Aura gives you near real-time alerts on suspicious credit inquiries, like if someone was opening a loan or credit card in your name. Their VPN lets you stay anonymous online by keeping your browsing history and personal information safe and encrypted, and they protect your devices from viruses, malware, spyware, and more so the bad guys can't break in. Aura even helps you manage what your kids can do on their devices. For example, you can restrict specific apps, set screen time limits, and even set focus times to ensure your child is doing homework instead of binging YouTube. And their password manager lets you store and access your online passwords securely and conveniently. Maybe you already have an app that does one of these things, but with Aura, you don't have to download and pay for numerous separate apps. 
Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online. Aura will give you a two-week free trial with my link if you sign up right now. You'll be shocked at how much of your private information Aura finds exposed over those two weeks. Go to Aura.com forward slash Southern Girl Crime to start your free trial, also linked below in the description, or scan the QR code. Melanie D. Flynn was born on November 24, 1952, to parents Bobby and Ella Ritchie Flynn. She was described as an energetic, outgoing, and free-willed individual who aspired to be a horse jockey or a singer. She traveled to Tennessee to pursue her love for music, and while pursuing her music career, she often went by the stage name Melanie O'Hara. When her music career didn't take off, Melanie moved back home to Kentucky with her family. She was hired as a groomer for a very well-known horse trainer, and besides traveling to the races around the country with him, Melanie also traveled with him to shoot movies and take vacations. At 24, after traveling around and gaining new experiences, Melanie moved back in with her family and quit her job as a groomer and began working as a secretary for the Kentucky High School Athletic Association in Lexington, Kentucky. On January 25, 1977, Melanie's father, Bobby Flynn, a Kentucky state senator at the time, called her and asked her to bring some materials home from the Kentucky High School Athletic Association. She said she would be home with the items after going to her 5.30 p.m. doctor's appointment. Melanie left work at 5 p.m. driving her red 1975 Ford Elite and was seen turning right off Cooper Drive onto South Limestone Street. A witness later reported seeing her talking to someone in a blue van near that intersection. Another witness claimed to have seen her in Nellie Kelly's, a Lexington restaurant at the time. At Nellie Kelly's, Melanie was talking to a man with a pock-marked face and brown hair parted down the middle. After these sightings, Melanie would go missing. She never arrived at her appointment and never came home. Her father reported her missing three days later. Two weeks after she went missing, a police officer found Melanie's car in an apartment building parking lot on Hollow Creek Road in Lexington. The surrounding area was known as a drug spot. Bobby initially believed his daughter might have developed amnesia and wandered off. She had fallen off a running horse in 1972 and suffered a serious head injury that had her hospitalized for months, and she permanently lost her senses of smell and taste. Later that summer in 1977, Melanie's purse was found floating in the Kentucky River near Camp Nelson, 20 miles south of Lexington. Come to find out, Melanie had agreed to become a police informant in order to avoid a marijuana possession charge and avoid ruining her reputation. She had agreed to introduce Detective Bill Cannon to people associated with the drug ring that was taking place in Lexington during the 1970s. To make it seem as if nothing fishy was going on, Melanie would take Cannon to lavish parties thrown by Anita and Preston Madden. When introducing Cannon to the people associated with the drug ring, Melanie would introduce him as her boyfriend. However, when questioned about these allegations, Cannon denies that he and Melanie had any such relationship. Also, being asked about her disappearance, Cannon doesn't think that the undercover work Melanie had been participating in had any connection to her disappearance, but her family believes that Cannon and Melanie were actually dating and that Cannon isn't being honest about it. What's more is that Cannon was the police officer to whom Bobby had reported Melanie's disappearance. Her parents believe Cannon was involved in their daughter's disappearance. Eventually, the story grew into an enormous scandal called the Bluegrass Conspiracy and connected to a multi-million dollar drug smuggling ring. While Cannon was never charged in connection with her disappearance, he was, however, arrested on federal drug charges in 1993 and spent 17 years in prison. Bobby and Ella theorized that there was a police cover-up after Melanie's disappearance and evidence was suppressed. They have publicly stated 
their theory that Cannon and possibly other police officers were involved in the abduction and murder of Melanie. Her parents couldn't understand why someone would want to get rid of their daughter. Bobby then went to Ralph Ross and asked him to oversee the investigation. At the time, Ralph Ross was the head of the Organized Crime and Intelligence Unit for the Lexington Police Department. Agreeing with Bobby, Ralph didn't think Bill Cannon was doing all these deeds alone. So Ross turned his attention to Andrew Thornton. Thornton was a narcotics officer and lawyer who became the head of the company, a drug smuggling ring in Kentucky. Along with Bill Cannon, Thornton became a member of the Lexington Police Department's narcotics squad in the early 1970s and worked on narcotics investigations with the Louisville office of the DEA. During his tenure, he began smuggling. After resigning from the police in 1977, Thornton practiced law in Lexington. Not only did Melanie date Cannon, but she had gone on a few dates with Thornton as well. Of course, he denied these allegations and said he and Melanie were just close friends. Something else that made Ross look into Andrew Thornton was the fact that just two weeks before Melanie's disappearance, Thornton had been caught stealing pot from the evidence room of the Lexington Police Department. Ross believes that after Thornton was caught, the Lexington Police Department cut him a deal and forced him to resign. Or the other reason that Thornton resigned was that he knew what was about to happen to Melanie. Some say he left for both reasons, but that will never be known. Investigators kept trying to track Thornton down, but were having a hard time. Then, on September 11, 1985, while on a smuggling run from Columbia, Thornton and a partner jumped from his auto-piloted Cessna 404 after dumping out 40 plastic containers full of cocaine in the Chattahoochee National Forest near Blairsville, Georgia. After jumping, Thornton became caught in his parachute and ended up in a free fall to the ground. His body was found in the driveway of Knoxville, Tennessee resident Fred Myers, and the plane crashed over 60 miles away in Hayesville, North Carolina. At the time of his death, Thornton was wearing a bulletproof vest and Gucci loafers. He was found in possession of night vision goggles, a green army duffel bag containing approximately 35 kilograms of cocaine valued at $15 million. $4,500 in cash, six gold Krugerrands weighing 2.8 grams apiece, knives, and two pistols. Three months later, a 175-pound dead black bear that had apparently overdosed on nearly 40 kilos of cocaine dropped by Thornton was found in the Chattahoochee National Forest. The bear became the state's most unlikely tourist attraction after finding and opening all 40 containers and consuming $15 million worth of coke. The story later inspired a 2022 movie titled Cocaine Bear. A local store in Lexington has since bought the remains of that bear. The bear is now stuffed and has become a local legend known as Pablo Escobar, or simply Cocaine Bear and is much loved by the community. At one point, Ross had a tip that came from the Texas Hotel in Daytona, Florida. People staying there said they had talked to Melanie and had recognized her from photographs they had seen. Witnesses said that the manners of the woman fit the description of Melanie's manners. It all seemed too convenient, though, and they could never confirm it was really Melanie Flynn. With no trail to follow, the investigation grinded to a halt. In an interview in 2012, a former female Lexington police officer stated, During the time of what was going on, you knew what those people were doing, but no one was going to speak up and say anything about what was going on. Some officers decided to stay out of the drug loop. Mostly there were rumors, and no one asked whether those rumors were true. The closest that officers out of the loop got to anything that was going on with the company was security at the lavish parties that Anita Madden had thrown at her house at Hamburg Place. The officers were asked to do security at a party. They thought it was overtime, and at the time, they just wanted the extra money. They knew the people that were around and what the people were doing. 
Also, they were told people were not supposed to be let into the parties, and if they tried to come, they would be escorted off the property. When looking at all the evidence, it's hard to put what happened to Melanie together into one solid solution. Rumors had floated that she was hidden at the rock quarry near Halls on the river. Also, another rumor surfaced that Melanie was buried in the concrete within the walls of an apartment complex. As a result, her loved ones may never know what truly happened to her. In 2019, investigators dug in different areas near Murphy's Landing along the Kentucky River on US-68 after a credible tip led detectives to the campground near Murphy's Landing. Police received a tip about a possible underground tank holding her remains. Sources said the information came from someone who wanted to get this off their chest. Lexington, Kentucky has made major changes since the 70s and 80s. The bluegrass conspiracy has dropped off the radar since the case was closed as a cold case. Still today, outsiders don't know everything that happened during the scandal, nor do most of the people involved. As a result, the truth about that fateful day when Melanie Flynn was kidnapped may never be known, and as of 2022, this case remains unsolved. Jessie Marie Twilight Song Crooks was born in New Mexico on October 22, 1985. Twilight was half Arapaho on her maternal side and part Cherokee on her father's side. When she spent time with her mother, she learned about her Arapaho heritage and created beadwork for her friends and family. At the age of 15, Jessie lived in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and was described as bubbly and energetic with a contagious smile who enjoyed swimming and playing soccer. She was a student at Greenwood High School and lived in the Plano subdivision on Larman Mill Road. Twilight was a straight-A student, and she had written about her dream of attending Harvard University, but she never said what she wanted to do with her education. On August 28, 2001, she spent time with several friends, first having dinner with them, and then hanging out and listening to music. After returning home, Twilight took a shower and told her dad and stepmom Linda Crooks goodnight. When her parents woke up the next morning, they found Twilight gone and reported her missing at 6 a.m. Authorities and volunteers in the community started a search, but were unable to find any signs of Twilight. The night she disappeared, her parents remembered hearing the phone ring at 10.56 p.m. Police were able to trace the call to a payphone outside the Plano Country Store. It's believed that she snuck out on foot to meet the person who called her that night. Unbeknownst to her father, Twilight would often sneak out of the house at night to meet up with friends. Nearly two weeks later, a man walking his dog off a trail in a remote area on Matlock Old Union Church Road crossed over to the border of a wooded area when his dog caught the scent of something. That's when the fully clothed remains of Twilight were found. Her killer had made a rather inept attempt to conceal her body by covering her with leaves and plants he had pulled up by the roots. She was found only five miles from her house. There were no shoes found nearby, but investigators learned from Twilight's friends that she usually left the house without wearing shoes if she wasn't going far from home when she snuck out. When recovered, the condition of Twilight's body showed that she had been killed the night she went missing. Also, evidence in the area suggested she had been killed in a different location than where her body was recovered. Because of the location where Twilight's body was discovered and the fairly complicated access path to it, investigators believe Twilight's killer was familiar with that area. It is believed that her murder was an impulsive act and not planned and that the person who is responsible still lives in her community. She was wearing an Edmondson County High School baseball jersey with the number 10 in a men's extra-large size, and her parents didn't recognize it. Her family and friends never remembered seeing her wear the jersey before her body was found, but it is possible that she owned it and left the house wearing it the night she was killed. 
the original owner was tracked down and donated the jersey to a Goodwill collection box in Brownsville. Twilight's purple fossil watch was never located at the scene. Investigators were able to recover DNA from the scene belonging to her killer. However, investigators have never released the cause of death. This information is purposely being withheld to help eliminate inaccurate and false information. Not even Twilight's father knows the details of the final moments of his daughter's life. Information he prefers not to know until her killer is taken into custody. He wants to keep the image of his beautiful daughter before she was murdered. Over the years, police have interviewed well over 100 persons in this investigation and have tracked down every lead that has come in, but her killer has never been located. Twilight likely knew her killer, and therefore, the people who knew Twilight likely also knew her killer. In 2021, the physical evidence was re-examined and submitted to the FBI's lab for analysis. Warren County Sheriff Brett Hightower said that with the public's help, there might be justice in this nearly 20-year-old case, but it will take someone coming forward no matter how small the information is. As of November 2022, her killer remains at large and this case remains unsolved.